What's up everyone, Ian and Molly here. We're gonna go ahead and take you through our daily mobility routine, which is actually formally known as controlled articular rotations from Kin Stretch. So we're gonna go ahead and get into it and kind of get go through it in terms of a walkthrough so that you can follow along, but there will be extra details in the text box below as well as at the end of the video. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna actually use this yoga block for a little feedback between Molly's knees. Could be a pillow, could be anything, and you can also do it without. What we're trying to do is get her to not sway side to side or bend her knees any more than they already are. We're starting to think about our pelvis as a bowl of water and we wanna really understand anterior and posterior tilt. You can think about spilling the bowl of water forward or spilling the bowl of water backwards. And we don't want it to come from our rib cage, our neck, our knees, the rest of our body. So we're gonna start off with five slow reps and we're simply just going to tilt the bowl of water forward on a three count and then slowly tilt backwards. When you go forwards, it's perfectly fine to maybe feel a little bit of your lower back firing up to tilt. It shouldn't be painful at all. When we come back, we're really thinking about accessing the lower part of our pelvic floor and really pulling ourselves into that tuck, maybe even feeling a little bit of your butt squeeze. What we're really thinking also is getting the ideal relationship between your rib cage being directly over your pelvis. When we understand that, we're gonna be much better at just moving through our shoulder, just moving through our hip, and avoiding any movement from our spine. So after you've done about five reps of that, let's go ahead and transition into our spinal car, which is gonna be similar to cat-cow where you're in all fours or the quadruped position. We wanna make sure that our hands are directly under our shoulders and our knees are directly under our hips. We're gonna start off in flexion or rounding as much as we possibly can. Now the goal is to individually move one by one each segment of your spine. So we're gonna start off here and she's gonna think about the wave starting at the bottom of her spine or spilling the bowl of water forward like we just did standing. And we're gonna slowly move through our spine. There's not five vertebrae in your spine, so if you do this rep in five seconds, then you're probably going a little bit too fast for what we're looking for. When we get to this mid-back, we wanna really feel this stuff fire up, and we wanna not squeeze our shoulder blades together. You also wanna really feel as if you're pulling your sternum through, eventually making it to your chin, coming up and using your neck. Now we'll reverse from the bottom, where you're gonna get that scoop under, or that bowl of water spilling backwards from the bottom, then the next one, then the next one. When we get to the low back, it's almost as if you're pulling your low back up to the ceiling or away from the ground, and then just slowly working your way up into that rounded position that we actually started in. We're gonna want you to do about five reps of this. Go as slow as you possibly can. And on the next one, let's go right through it again. She's gonna go ahead and just start right from the bottom and you can just go on your own, nice and slow. A Couple of things that we're looking to have happen here is we don't wanna move just from one part of your spine. If you actually video it in slow-mo it, you might notice that you're not moving so well through all of them like you think. We, again, don't wanna see us squeezing our shoulder blades to try to be our upper back, and you should feel the right stuff really pulling you into these positions. Reverse that from the bottom one more time. The other thing to really consider is the idea that we wanna be able to move from our spine from both the top and the bottom. So right now we started the wave from the bottom, worked our way up, but that doesn't mean that when we get here, we can't work on keeping this all locked in, really feeling this stuff work and pull in and under with the abs. And then we can start her from her chin or the top of her spine. Just go ahead, you can go nice and smooth. When she gets to there, we'll eventually be pulling our sternum through again and working our way one by one through until we end up in that arch position or extension again. Beautiful. Now switching, you should feel your lower back fired up. That's okay, it's supposed to work here and you're gonna slowly tuck the chin and then think about pulling these upper segments up to the ceiling. Rounding out your upper back, eventually getting to your lower back and starting to pull those up as well. Take your time, go super slow and really feel each segment working one by one. Okay, you can relax for a second. You could even close your eyes. That would be a, one thing that you could try um, and really focus on the sensation of moving each individual vertebrae. It's definitely a good cue for you. 
Okay, so moving on, we're gonna go ahead and stand back up and we're gonna get into our thoracic car. One of the things that I also like to mention is the idea of really using the spine out progression. So what I mean by that is when we do our cars, I like to move the spine first, then the shoulder blades, then the shoulder, then the elbow. So working from that middle out and really letting everything build on top of each other is something I would suggest for your practice. So with this um, thoracic car, what we're actually gonna do is have her cross her arms and just hug herself. We do want your shoulder blades to reach forward and protract, so that's perfectly fine. Do not squeeze them back again. Now, we're gonna break this down. So what she's first gonna do is actually just segmentally flex and just round her upper back. What we're looking to have happen is none of the lower back is supposed to move. And from the front view, you shouldn't see any of this move either. Once she rounds all the way out, I just want her to segmentally extend or just pick her chest back up. So again, because it's a little bit of a complex movement, we're just breaking it down into steps. One more time, just like that, slowly, segmentally, one by one, using each vertebrae to peel down and crunch a little bit, and then reverse and come back into extension. From there, what we can do is go ahead and add the rotational component. So we'll have her just become straight right in front, and now I want you to just rotate to the left. When we come to the left, just pause. I'd like the hips to be headlights that face straight forward. If you see them turn, you went too far. You can think about your sternum as your guide. That's actually what's really moving. Now rotate back the other way. There's always a closing angle and an opening angle. When we go to the right, we should feel this open up and we should feel this contract and close. Come back towards me one more time. Same thing, no pinch on the side. Come towards me to the left. Hips stay nice and straight. We should feel a little nice stretch through here. Never any pain with any of your cars. Now come back to the middle and we'll flex and come down. We're gonna go ahead and do the full rep now that we've broken it down. Once she flexes, we're gonna go ahead and rotate. Then we're gonna do a little side bend. So you can think about lateral flexion. Then we're gonna go ahead and go into the next. We're gonna extend. Good. A Little bit of a side bend again. And then rotate feeling all this open up. Then she can flex and come right back through the middle. We'll continue in that direction for one more rep. As you're doing this, try to be as controlled as possible. You can reset yourself at any moment. Remember the knees are not supposed to move. There's headlights on the hips that are facing forward. And you can really kind of think about the lower back down is not allowed to move on both sides. So if you want to use your belly button as a marker, that's a good marker. If you start to see that you're arching your lower back or swaying all over the place, just get back in front of the mirror, take a breath, reset yourself, and then um, just finish those reps. So we want to go ahead and do them both directions too. So make sure that you go left, make sure that you go right, and then we'll always make sure that you're going super slow and feeling zero pain at all. We're going to take you through two more one in each direction. We're gonna use the yoga block now. We're gonna hug it and reach all the way around it. Sometimes getting this here can really help. And what we'll do is just go through one rep in each side. So, and then let's go to the right this time. So as you're going through this, we can use the block to kind of assist in a radiation or just creating tension around the body. It'll really give you a little bit more feedback and it also forces us to get away from squeezing our shoulder blades back. If we wanna articulate or move our upper back, Getting the shoulder blades out of the way is a really, really great way to actually get into the right spots instead of just squeezing our shoulder blades all over the place. Most people are gonna to try to rely too much on the shoulder blades. So again, they should relatively stay locked in while we move through the rest of our body. Another great way that you could do this without weight would be to really use a stability ball. So just the one that you're seeing everybody, maybe a Swiss ball that you're doing abs on and really reaching all the way around it. That'll set everything up well too. Finishing that last rep, very nice. The last variation, which is actually our favorite, but you might not have the ball, is using a lighter med ball. So you can just go through one more rep. Again, we're flexing. Like I said, being able to reach around the ball, especially with people that are having trouble with flexing their upper back, thinking about getting that to pull in there and actually having the roundness of the ball will assist in you getting that down much quicker. And it also gives us the ability to really, again, establish where our upper back ends and where our lower back begins just by it being there. Remember, we don't want any pinching, especially as you go to the sides. If you're going on a closing side, like pinching to the left, make sure that you go a little bit less. Your reps could also be a little bit smaller, even if it looks just like this. And it's a little bit less range of motion. Build up slowly over time. 
So that's gonna be our thoracic, uh, med ball thoracic car. Moving on from our thoracic car, we're gonna keep the spine going, we're gonna actually do our neck. So similar to how we taught you as a thoracic car, we're gonna also teach our neck like that. So she's gonna slowly just flex down and then extend up. And the same thing, we're really thinking one by one. When we go up and extend back, I want you to think about finding a stretch in the front by not just getting your head back, but getting your chin up and then back. So we're really creating length going up. Let's do two or three of those. When we show you the actual full neck car, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do them in progressions of size. So a lot of people need their neck car to start off a little bit um, smaller of range of motion in order to avoid any pinching. So every rep she does out of the three we do are actually gonna gain an increase in size. So let's start that full one. She's gonna flex down. Then we're gonna go ahead and think about having a marker on her chin. We're gonna draw a circle to the side, eventually tilting our head back, keeping it nice and small, that's good enough. Now rotate back the other way, eventually coming down, getting close to the chest, but not there since this is a small rep. Keep coming towards me. Now we'll reverse it in that same size. So we'll do one in each direction, and then the next one will end up being a little bit of a bigger circle. So oftentimes one of the big mistakes you'll see when we're doing the neck cars is a lot of side bending. We want you to be able to really rotate without just closing down. So if you find yourself getting a pinch, maybe you shrugged or maybe you just went a little too far and your circle might be smaller like we're showing you now. Keep that in mind. We never want to go into any pinching sensations or anything painful at all. Now as we go into our next rep, we'll just slowly get a little bit bigger. You can start to feel maybe your feet locked into the ground. Maybe you start to feel your lower abs a little bit, start to create a little tension through your hands. We can also increase through the tension that we're putting through our body and make it a little bit more of an intense training stimulus instead of just kind of slowly getting things moving. Still being super precise with our circle. And again, the best cue I can give you is to really think about you have that marker on your chin and you're slowly drawing that circle. If you find any spot that's extra hard, extra jolty as if you skip through it, that's a clear sign that this is a corner or a spot within your neck that needs extra work. And it might even make sense to do a couple of quarter cars, half cars, or just spend more time within that position that your neck is showing you. Remember your cars are beautifully an assessment. Every single day you get to figure out exactly what you need, exactly what's wrong, and even track your progress on what is getting better. So there's our neck. Now, progressing from the spine out, the next one up will be our shoulder blades, okay? So what we want our shoulder blades is to be able to glide on our rib cage. So try to take a breath at any point and reset yourself if you feel like you need it. Now we're gonna get our hands straight out in front of us. We're gonna lock our elbows out, and we're gonna also imagine as if we had a gymnastics ring around our arm and we don't want you to touch that. So there shouldn't be too much of this movement up and down. The first thing we're gonna do is break it down. We're gonna have her protractor reach her shoulder blades forward towards the camera. So your shoulder blades should reach on the rib cage. Then we're gonna have her retract and squeeze her shoulder blades together, just like you would on a pulling exercise. Then we're gonna go all the way out forward again. Try to see if you can do a three to five second count and be as smooth as possible. Try to avoid any jumpiness. Now reach our squeeze all the way back one more time. Notice her elbows aren't bending. We're not changing anything in the rib cage. It's just nice and smooth. Now reach all the way forward. Now from here, I want you to just go up and down two times. So slowly shrug up, slowly shrug down. Shrugging has been demonized, but it really is just a fundamental motion of the shoulder blade all the way up, all the way down. Now, since we've broken them up in those four steps, it's a circle, you can start wherever you want, but we're gonna have her go forward, up, back, and down, and we'll have her do three in each direction. So you do three in that direction and then reverse. If you notice when you reverse directions, you have extra trouble or it's a little bit harder for you in that direction, that's again, another sign that maybe you should double down on that and it should be a spot that should be prioritized for you. We can also think about having scapular control is going to improve our lifting, our exercise. So any of the pulling exercises that you might have been doing for your posture, they're only going to go as far as you're able to access and control the musculature around your shoulder blades. If you've ever done a, a back workout and not been sore in the back and just had your forearms and your wrists sore, maybe just biceps, this could be something that could be an absolute game changer for you. Really quickly, we'll go ahead and put our hands by our side and we'll just have her do one rep 
all the way around, nice big circle down by the side. This is just to illustrate that we want your shoulder blades to work anywhere. So anywhere is actually a spot. Just make sure it matches the intent of no elbow bend, no spinal movement, and all the other compensations that we went through. So moving forward from our uh, shoulder blades, we're gonna go ahead and progress right into shoulder rotation. So we're gonna have her put her arms straight out to the side. And what we wanna do is really be able to see that there's an X on her bicep, and I want that X to actually move and rotate towards the ground for internal and rotate away for external. Let's go ahead and do slow, slow five reps. And what I want you to focus on is not moving from your wrist first. So I'd like you not to drive the motion from the wrist to the elbow, but to actually get the shoulder and the X on the bicep to actually initiate the movement. You should feel some stuff deep in the armpit and around the shoulder really working here because that's the tissue that we're trying to access that may have taken some time off in the past of your training. So now what we're gonna do is the exact same thing, except bend the elbows. We wanna keep this 90 degree angle right here, and we're gonna do the exact same thing, internal and external rotation. You might notice this looks very similar to a baseball player throwing or a lot of other fundamental movements, shoulder press, pull-ups. So this is a really fundamental position and there is nothing more fundamental than rotational capacity for your actual shoulder joint. If it doesn't rotate well, it won't do anything else well. So that's why we really harp on it in FRC. And we're also establishing this so that when we go into our actual shoulder car, you'll see exactly what we're talking about. So now, after that, we can go ahead and relax, have the hand by the side. We're gonna make a fist with our right hand. Our left arm, we're gonna start off with a nice regress rep, and we're just gonna go a little bit across our body, but not too much. Then we're gonna come out to the side. Freeze right here. So this is very important, and this is why we showed you the rotation before. I don't wanna just swing my hand and think about where my hand is. I actually wanna get this rotation to happen from the shoulder and even keep it a nice small range of motion. When we go back, it might not even be that far behind our body, that's okay. And then we're gonna reach back and eventually rotate all the way around. So there's one rep. I'm gonna get out of the way and let her do two more on this side. The second one will be a little bit more range of motion, and then the third one will follow with an increase as well. The reason we do this is if you're going through it and swinging your whole entire body around and not moving just through the shoulder, you're getting less out of it than if you were just to regress to progress. So think about it like that. Find out where you can be. See yourself in the mirror. Make sure your sternum's not rotating all over the place. Make sure you're not extending your lower back to get overhead. And make sure you're not bending your elbow, which is really the hardest one to see. Even something as slight as moving your neck out of the way is something we don't want, so keep that in mind as well. After you finish this third one, we can go ahead and do the same exact thing on the right side or the opposite side if you did your right first. When we're doing them again, keep focusing on that X on your bicep. Getting that rotational component to really be a focus is absolutely essential to these. Oftentimes, we're gonna go ahead and get asked about cracking, popping, any of those things. There is movement happening at the joint level. We are bringing in synovial fluid and it's not supposed to be super uh, smooth, maybe your first one especially, but try to avoid any popping, pinching, any snapping, anything that's really, really sketchy. Make it smaller and over time progress. So that way it's safer and you're still getting a great training stimulus by regressing it anyway. Again, big things, sternum and rib cage are gonna be huge. No rotation, no lower back arching. Keep a little bit of light tension throughout the body and eventually add more tension. These are something that could even eventually end up with a um, ankle weight on the wrist. Nice, okay, so finishing up this last one, nice and smooth. You can see how it's absolutely essential to be able to get into these positions if you wanna lift weights there, if you wanna do a pull up there. Being able to get there at the joint level is the prerequisite to being strong there. Nice, okay. Now, moving on from shoulder, going straight out, we're gonna get into elbow. So with elbow, we'll do both at the same time. We're gonna have the hands by our side. What I'd like you to do is really be strict with this angle right here. So from the elbow all the way to the pinky, I don't want any of this stuff to happen. I don't want you to move through your wrist. And if we need a marker, we can have an X on our forearm for this one. So we're gonna start off by actually trying to turn the X on the uh, forearm out 
and flexing. So we're gonna flex. Think about when you do a front rack position or even a full bicep curl, we wanna make sure that we fully flex and really squeeze our bicep as much as we can. From there, we're gonna flip the hand over, which again, keeping that line as best as possible, we're gonna come all the way down and extend. Your triceps are doing this, so that's perfectly normal to feel them. We'll keep one more rep in that direction, flip over, flex all the way up, eventually flipping that over. Things to look for on this, maybe shoulders are hiking up side to side, maybe you're doing a lot of stuff with your fingers, doing a little Zoltan, some weird signs, it happens. Just make sure that you're really keeping that angle as best you can. Feel free to make a fist. So let's go ahead and come all the way down. Now reverse directions with the fist. Okay. It's okay, do one more like that. So reverse would come up into that nice reverse curl and then we'd rotate out and come all the way down. If you do find yourself doing a lot of stuff with the hand and the fingers, you can make a fist. These eventually could turn into loaded again with dumbbells. Um, you'll see that on our channel as well. So that's how we're gonna go ahead and do elbow. Now, moving on from elbow, we're gonna get into wrist. We're gonna go ahead and put our hands straight out. We're gonna do one at a time here, just do two in each direction. I want you to put your hand over your forearm. The goal of this is because we don't wanna move through our elbow any longer. We just did elbow, so we want this to stay there. Cell phone is also another option to put here. Let's break it down quickly and go into extension. If you don't have close to 90 degrees and you're doing handstands, that's gonna be an issue in the long run. Let's come all the way back. We wanna have 90 degrees degrees of flexion. This has gotten a lot better. Good. Now all the way down. So there's flexion and extension, breaking it down to half. Now we're going to go in, flex towards us all the way around. And let's do one rep in each direction. I like the idea of having the fingers nice and long as if you had a book in your hand, but we can also do the fist, which we'll show you on the other wrist. Now, what you're gonna see is a lot of people when they do the fingers version is they're gonna break at the fingers and the wrist will no longer be moving. Try to see if you can keep it as straight as long as possible without any of that breakdown at all. You might also notice a lot of the elbow kind of shoulder dipping down. It's not the end of the world, but just make sure wherever you started is where you finish so that the intent stays the same throughout the movement. Good, finishing that last one up. And then we'll switch to the other side. We'll do the right one and we'll do it with a fist. If you need something light, such as a tennis ball to irradiate to create more tension, that's definitely an option. It really helps for some people. The sneaky one that you'll see here as she's finishing one in each direction is, or two in each direction, is that you'll see a lot of people using elbow extension and flexion to cheat the wrist. So if I can't fully flex, I'll start to come up to fake that motion. If I can't fully extend, I'll start to extend at the elbow to fake that motion. So whatever that angle of the elbow is, is also really important. Try to keep that in mind while you're going through these. Really, really important to keep the wrist moving, to keep it having full range of motion. Again, push-ups, any of the, even pull-ups, um, and definitely 100% handstands. Putting that much weight on a joint that doesn't work well, is definitely not a good idea. So let's go ahead and move on into hip now. Moving on into hip, similar to how we did the shoulder and um, also the knee, what we wanna be able to do is really establish what hip rotation actually is and what it really feels like. So what we're gonna do is have Molly pull her knee up to 90 degrees. When she gets into that 90 degrees, I wanna think that there's a stake going down into her hip right through the knee so that this line doesn't change. Meaning I don't want it to come all the way across her body here, up, down, it should relatively stay there. You can even take a finger for yourself and just place that right on there and want you to show them that. So keep that there. Now from here, we're gonna go into internal rotation thinking about screwing it into the hip capsule, good, and then all the way the other way into external. Let's do three reps like that nice and slow. We can even try to see if we can keep this at perfect 90 degrees so that we have that nice and uniform. The other thing that I like to do is take your hand and put it right here on your pelvis so that you can actually feel whether you're hiking up or not. So just do one more rep for me. As you come toward me for internal rotation, a lot of people are gonna hip hike and fake that range of motion. And then as we go the other way, you might feel it drop and actually sag down towards your feet. Try to avoid both those things. Now let's go ahead and switch to the other side. Let's do three. This is also another opportunity for you to actually assess yourself. 
So you'll see if you're limited in hip IR or limited in hip ER. You can see Molly's a little limited <laughs> in that hip IR. It happens, but most of us are. What we'd really want to see is 45 degrees in both directions, but honestly, that's not really going to happen with too many people, but it's something that we're going to work towards, and FRC is the best and fastest way to get there. So after you do three reps of that, we're going to go ahead and take you through two different hip cars. The first one's going to be the quadruped position. They, not necessarily better one or the other, it's just more about um, different uh, intents with these. So let's have you flip around, go the other way. With the quadruped hip car, what we're gonna do is really work on locking everything in with our hands, with our spine, and making sure that this does not change at all. Oftentimes people get tired on the hands and not be able to push or collapse like that. So push the ground away, really make sure we're nice and long here. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna bring the hip into just a little bit of IR, and then we're gonna bring the knee up towards our elbows. From there, we're gonna come out to the side, and then we're gonna go into heel up to the ceiling, guiding it back all the way around, coming down to where we started. Now we're gonna reverse directions, kicking back. Good. And then we're gonna come out towards me and eventually externally rotate. You can see why we showed you that hip rotation first and coming all the way around. Let's go ahead and do two more reps on that side while I just talk about some of the things we want to avoid. So again, we talked about the idea of avoiding where the spine is. We talked about the idea of really understanding that your hip needs to rotate in order to access any position. So working on the fundamental rotational capacity at the joint level is going to carry over into all these other patterns, including squatting, running, deadlifting, whatever it might be that you want. We also want to make sure as we kick back, we don't extend through the lower back or lose the lower abs. Beautiful. So make sure that you don't do that. We should really be able to feel our glutes and our hamstrings working and really owning the entire range of motion. Let's have you do just one more like that. In order to make it a little bit smaller, we can just make the range of motion a little bit smaller. You might not go towards your elbows as far. You might not go out as far. Maybe you don't get your heel as high up to the ceiling. So find out where your hip is capable of going today without any compensations, and then work really hard on perfecting that so that we're not really going into the lower back and reinforcing some of the compensations that we might find. Let's do that right side. Why don't you start off the first one with a really good regression, something that would be someone who's maybe a little bit more limited in the hip. So maybe they just go there, good. So as soon as you go forward, we don't wanna round our lower back. Show them what rounded looks like. So if I run out of hip room, I use my lower back. Should sound familiar like a lot of um, deadlifting, um, kind of injuries and other things like that. Then go all the way out. Maybe you don't go so far out. Definitely don't lean towards me at all. Good, show them what the lean looks like. That would be that fall over to the side, so keep it there. Now the heel goes up to the ceiling and we start to guide back. You should feel that inner thigh start to extend the hip and then come towards me and down. Now when we reverse it again, maybe you don't get full hip extension. So just go a little bit right there. Maybe this is where your car ends. Then you bring it out to the side and then come to there. Doing that is much better over the long run than just cranking into your lower back. Do two more. Maybe the next one has a little bit more range of motion in it. And what's gonna happen is the standing hip car is gonna be a little bit different than the quadruped, and that's really just because your knee's in the other way, so any adduction or coming across the body or even maxing out external rotation in the front is a little bit harder because the knee is there. So just keep that in mind, and we're gonna show you two reps of the standing hip car anyway. Good, finishing that up. Very good. And we're gonna do one last one, okay? So third rep. What we can also think about doing is keeping a yoga block on your back. So I could put that here, or you could be up against the wall. So if I was the wall right here, coming up against, she's not able to lean into me. It's just another quick, easy way to really make this a little bit better for someone, giving them a little bit of a feedback or a little bit of a block. Just know that we don't want you to rely on any of the feedbacks or the blocks. At some point, you should know where your hip is in space without the wall holding you in or without the yoga block locking in your lower back. So that's how we're gonna do the quadruped hip car. Again, no pinching, no pain. Focus on that control and strength throughout the whole range of motion. 
We're gonna go ahead and take you through the standing hip car now. We are using the stick, but we suggest, especially when you're first doing it, to really be as balanced and as stable as possible, holding onto a chair, hugging a pole. There's a lot of different ways that it may be a little bit more stable than the sticks. These are a progression that we also suggest working towards, and we'll give you the information for the, a discounted stick mobility in the text box below for you. Now, the reason that we're also showing this is because they're gonna be able to really integrate the foot with the hip. So feeling your butt burning on the standing leg is perfectly normal and actually really something we want anyway. There's a couple of different ways to go about this, but we're gonna go ahead and show you the way that makes the most sense to me where we're actually hitting every single corner of the hip. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna straighten the leg out and then we're gonna even turn our toes away from me or internally rotate our hip. Now from there, we're gonna go ahead and bend and flex the hip coming all the way up and across the body. So in the ideal world, you're a little bit across the body and your foot's out even. From there, we're gonna externally rotate, so she's gonna bring her heel away from me. Remember our capsule car, now out, pulling this out as far as we can. As we come out, we don't want this to turn. There's a hip or a headlight on that hip, good. And then from here, we're gonna go ahead and get the heel up to the ceiling, internal rotation, guide it back and then all the way around. Now, very particular on these, but when we're doing it, we don't wanna be moving through our lower back especially. There's gonna be movement from the pelvis, especially when you get above 90 degrees, but for right now, let's keep the reps small, come out towards me, eventually bring the heel forward, external rotation, adducting towards, we're gonna to get as far as we can like this so that we get that corner that we were talking about. Then we can even internally rotate and slowly straighten the leg out down by the side. Reset your rep, get your balance, take a breath if you need it, and let's do one more. Turning in, internal rotation, flexion across the body with adduction. Then she's gonna go ahead and externally rotate, bring that heel up and come all the way out to the side. Then we're internally rotating from here, trying to get the heel up as the knee goes away, all the way around, eventually getting close to that other knee. Kicking back, remember, just like our quadruped one, we don't want to arch the lower back, and then coming out to the side, and then we're gonna get that external rotation and hip flexion and adduction pulling forward, eventually coming down, relaxing that there, and we'll just do two on the other side, same way. Why don't we show this one? Someone might be a little bit limited in the hips so they're not able to get across their body. So just come straight up. Instead of being able to get across, we'll just go straight up, eventually externally rotate. Maybe you have a little bit less, so do a little bit less than that. So maybe it looks just like that and then you bring it out. When we go out again, keeping this nice and straight, then she brings the heel back, guiding it back, feeling her hips, her hamstrings, all of that stuff, extending it backwards, trying not to rotate, kick back abduct away from the side, feeling the side hip work, and then bringing it through with that rotation. Just do one more, and you can do it however you want, maybe a little bit progressed. Again, really making sure that that rotational component is both assessed, it's worked on, and it's really emphasized in these. We're not just throwing our hip around. This should be very slow, it should be very deliberate. There should be no pinching, no pain, and we definitely wanna feel and assess where we need to work on our individual hips. Last one, coming back all the way around, nice and smooth, beautiful job. So that's gonna be how we do that standing single leg hip car. Moving on, we're gonna go ahead and get into knee. Similar to how we taught hip and shoulder, um, we're gonna make sure that we have rotation down first since it's such an important component. The knee is not a hinge joint. It definitely rotates in and out, so it does all four of those things in terms of um, flexion, extension, internal and external rotation. When we're looking at the tibia, this line right here, that bone is what we're looking for to move, and we want it to move bringing the ankle with it, but not separating from the ankle. The other thing that we don't want to have happen is the hip to join the party and move all over the place. So by keeping this block here, we're able to really lock that in. What is doing the tibial rotation is gonna be your knee, uh, your hamstrings, tugging on the knee and pulling in on the outside contracting, pulling in on the inside. So you can kind of think about that and visualize that. If you dig your heel into the ground a little bit, it should activate those and make it a little easier. Now, what I'd like to see is you be able to rotate your knee out 
as far as you can, and then rotate your knee in three times on each side. As always, this is an assessment, so you can see, all right, well, I don't rotate out very well. Maybe you see your ankle drives the movement. Maybe you notice that you didn't have the yoga block and your hip is actually moving all over the place. So we wanna do three on each side, and then we'll get into that full knee car. So same thing here, rotating out and then rotating in. If you want, you can get extra feedback by putting your hand right over that spot that we talked about and really feeling it move under your hand is a great way to know that it's actually moving. Now, let's go ahead and get rid of the block and you're gonna go ahead and go into that headlock position. So you can tuck this leg under, put it wherever you want. As we grab this, there should be no pinching in the front of the hip. So if this position is uncomfortable for you, you could sit on a yoga block. You could even sit on an actual chair really high up, or we can go ahead and just lean back and make the distance between your hip not as far, or not as close. So from here, we're gonna go ahead and rotate out, and then we're gonna go ahead and extend. You don't need to lock your knee out and then you're gonna rotate in and flex down. We'll do three in each direction, nice and slow. Again, thinking about what's actually happening right in that knee joint, rotating out, coming up, rotating in, coming down, being able to really get every single little spot with control is super important. If you see that you can't do something, especially in terms of rotation, coming all the way up, maybe there's a spot where you're not able to really feel it, staying there and just doing a couple of reps of the rotation like we showed you in the beginning is an option, or just doing extra reps going through that exact spot, nice and slow with a little bit of focus. So after you do the third one on this side, we'll go ahead and switch to the other. Again, recognizing that if there's a certain direction, that's something that might need to be doubled up on if you don't have control there. And instead of the rotation, let's just do the whole thing, three in a row. So you're gonna extend all the way up. We should feel the stretch in our hamstring. Again, no pinching in the front of the hip. And you should feel your quads really working to do that since that's what's gonna really extend your knee. Try your best to keep the ankle coming along for the ride, but not necessarily driving the movement, especially the rotation. So if you start to see your ankle moving, but there's nothing going on here, then that means that we're gonna need to really make sure that we're going a little bit more intent on the actual knee moving and not just driving it through the ankle. So even when you're thinking about it and really kind of cueing yourself internally, try not to use that foot, especially the toes as your marker. If you're thinking about where the toes go, you're probably gonna move through your ankle, which you can see when we do ankle next is what we're looking for on that, but not necessarily on the knee car finishing up that and then we'll go ahead and get into ankle moving on getting into the ankle we're gonna go ahead and start off with this left side um, ankle car is something that we see a lot of compensations on so we're actually gonna use this as an opportunity to show you a regression here so as we go through this we're gonna go a nice small circle the first thing we're gonna do is gonna gas pedal down so we're gonna plantar flex like a dancer then we're gonna go ahead and come in pull towards us and then we're gonna rotate our evert out and then down and we'll do two reps just like that so molly had uh, some really bad ankle sprains on this side so it's a good opportunity to really show a regress to progress approach we don't want her to really go too far so that she ends up going through her knee going through her hip or compensating in any other ways but really hammering out and scooping out the corners here as best she can without compensating is what we're going to really really want you to do with your ankle cars especially let's go ahead and switch and do two on the other side whenever you're ready when we do the uh, ankle car you're also going to see some spots that are really jolty like some of the other ones that's again another opportunity to carve out that circle and really spend more time under tension in that specific position another way to assess yourself daily and see if all the hard work that maybe you're putting into your ankle is really progressing and, and paying off now another thing that we see you can go ahead and do the right side when we do um, any ankle mobility is oftentimes through two in each direction. We'll see someone that's actually gonna be really cranky on dorsiflexion and maybe even hitting a wall and making no more progress. What we can do is go back to inversion and eversion and try to create some 3D space in the joint. That way there's more room to work with when we actually do our dorsiflexion work and it can really pay off in the long run. I've actually had a lot of people who have gone through that similar um, scenario and really had a lot of success with that. Again, gas pedaling down, you should feel your calf work. When you pull your uh, toes back, we should feel the shin work. As we come in, there's all the stuff that spirals through the ankle, feeling that, 
and then when we come out there should be a shortening sensation on the outside as it pulls the toes towards us through that whole entire rep. So let's make sure that you get at least two of those and that's how we're going to be doing the ankle car. Thank you so much for tuning in and doing the entire routine with us. Getting as many reps as possible every single day is exactly what we suggest and upping the intensity and even load over time. Please let us know if you have any questions in the comments sections below or even feel free to DM or email me directly. If you'd like to learn more, check out our level one Kin Stretch Anywhere program where it's a structured program to get you to your mobility goals as soon as possible. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.